Welcome everyone. I'm Danielle De Giorgio, and I am the Digital Dexterity Champion for Edith Cowan University. I have been part of the working group planning, organizing, and facilitating this uh, Digital Dexterity Virtual Festival. Thank you for joining us today for this session. Uh, firstly, I would like to ask that you all mute yourselves and turn off your cameras if you haven't already done so. On behalf of the organizing working group, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands across Australia and New Zealand where we meet today. I'm on Wajuk Nunga Buja. If you know the land you're on today, feel free to put it in the chat. Uh, we acknowledge and celebrate the inherent strengths of Aboriginal, Torres Strait Islander and other First Nations peoples and communities and recognize their continuing connection to land, waters, sky and culture. We pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Today, we have an exciting program for you. In total, there will be six amazing items that will explore the digital dexterity themes of digital identity, digital reputation and data literacy. To make it easy on everyone, we will be doing day three in three parts with a short 10 minute screen break in between the sessions. So the first uh, part will, um, will be starting the day with a workshop followed by a short 10 minute break. Then we'll have four lightning talks followed by another 10 short minute break um, and then a concluding presentation to finish off. So. Just so you know the structure for today, I'll introduce the speakers before each segment. If time permits, we will have questions at the end of the workshop um, and presentations. At the end of the session today, we will also be sharing a link to a Google poll. By answering the questions in the poll, you will assist in shaping future events and we hope that you can make the time to do so. Before we get started, I would like to thank the Digital Dexterity Champions Network, and in particular, the event organizing working group who helped make this event possible. Today, I have uh, Sarah Davidson who will be helping out. If you have any technical um, difficulties or any questions throughout the session, please send a private chat message to uh, Sarah, da uh, Sarah Davidson um, at Caval who will be able to help you. Now, let's get into the session, the first workshop, your Reputation, A Lifetime to Build, An Instant to Destroy, is by Tara Starbird, who is the Digital Literacy Trainer at the Australian National University. Thanks, Tara. I will hand it over to you now. So nothing too presumptuous in the title. <laughs> Welcome, everyone. My name is Tara Starbird, and this session is actually based on a session that I run for undergrad, postgrad, and lecturers, um, sort of catering it a bit to each group. Um, I've tried to make it uh, as uh, suitable to this audience, but a lot of this is sort of from a student perspective. So just a little rundown of what we do is during a week and a few times of the year, we have a digital footprint session where we go through the pitfalls of a life lived online and uh, how they can protect themselves and promote themselves professionally. So that's sort of, this is what this is based on. I've done my best to sort of mold it into this format, um, but it is a much longer presentation usually. Um, sorry, I've been muted. I'm, I'm sitting here getting ready to go. Um, apologies, everyone. Um, so, I will begin again. Uh, this is your reputation, uh, a lifetime to build, an instant to destroy. So as I was talking while I was muted, um, this is based on some managing your digital footprint sessions that we run for students and undergrads. So while I've tried to mold this into a librarian's perspective, this is really about what the library is trying to offer to students, lecturers, and the like on how to be a digital human, how to live in this digital world as cautiously and professionally as you can, given the landscape. Um, I'll be sort of keeping an eye on the chat as best I can. So if you have any questions, I, I will try to answer them as I go. However, uh, I can't always see everything. So I will try to leave some time at the end to ask um, your questions. So just before we begin, you probably saw that I ask you to Google yourself, and this is what I ask students and lecturers to do. Do not, you don't need to share this with anyone. It's just so you know what comes up when you Google your name. If you have a very common name, 
I notice we have a Bruce White. There's lots of Bruce Whites likely. So you might want to put it in quotation marks and then maybe put um, the city you live in. So just to get what would come up on you if someone were to Google you. So again, you don't need to share this. Uh, I value your privacy. <laughs> uh, okay, so the title of the session is Your Reputation, A Lifetime to Build. An oh, is it not showing? Oh my gosh. I have, it does say I'm sharing, but let's go back then, sorry. Oh, this is the pitfalls of um, technology. Let's go share. Can we see it now? Yes. Yeah, it yes. said it was sharing, interestingly enough. Oh, fun technology. Okay. So I'm getting, um, getting the presenter view up for my own self. He said, I will try to keep an eye on the chat, but you know, because you've got your screens going and everything at once, it is tricky to see it all. Um, so yeah, the chat's now disappeared for me. But that's all right. We'll go from here. So Yes, yeah, so Google yourself, please, if you can. Um, again, you won't need to share. It's just so that I have that information. Um, so some caveats before we begin. I am a privacy enthusiast, but I'm not an expert. So this is just something that I am very passionate about, but I really encourage everyone who attends these um, sessions to research for yourself and come to your own conclusions. Um, so I'm going to show some websites, platforms, and software that I demonstrate. Um, but I'm not endorsing them. Again, I really want you to do your own research and make up your own mind. Um, and this is really about harm minimization, not harm removal. So there's no perfect way to live online and keep your identity fully safe. And that's just true. Uh, so another thing I'll say, I do talk a lot about your professional identity and I'm not telling people not to be their true self. Um, I'm happy for anyone to be their true self online, but you should do so knowing um, the reality of the digital landscape that we live in. I'm just going to try to see if I can make chat appear again, but it's not wanting to come up for me. So I will have to just wait for the end to find that chat. So um, this is something I think we can ask ourselves. You don't need to answer in the chat now, but as librarians, we're really all about open access. Like we just don't stop talking about open access. Do you feel this extends to our personal data? Should it be all open, all that data out there? Or should we as sort of custodians of information be helping people to stem that flow of information when it comes to themselves? Uh, so I've got some next slides for you to view. And I want you to just think about what comes to mind for you when you see these images. So a lot of people when they see tattoos have a lot of different views. So whether you like tattoos or don't, I myself have a few tattoos, so I'm, I'm all fine with them, but they do have a lot of meaning, both culturally and personally for people. Sometimes tattoos can be very beautiful. Uh, sometimes it can be a poetic thing that's just special to you. Uh, sometimes they can just be a regretful moment of your life. Um, this is, it's is my life, John Bovey. So for those who don't know John, uh, John Bon Jovi, this, uh, this is a permanent reminder of John Bon Jovi in your life. And sorry, and people get tattoos for a number of reasons. Like I said, there are cultural reasons, there are personal reasons, religious reasons. Sometimes just, you know, you're having a day and you feel like getting a tattoo, but it is really a personal decision that people make, something that they choose to do, that permanent mark they're going to make on themselves. But what if I told you that every single thing you do online, everything you like, watch, search, email was just a tattoo, but a digital tattoo that's going to carry with you for the rest of your life. So with that in mind, I want you to think about the last thing that you shared on social media. Uh, so it could be recently, it could be, you know, many moons ago. So I'm just trying to see if I can get the chat up. And if you're comfortable, um, you feel free to share in the chat, which I've now found, um, what was the last thing you shared on social media? So if you don't want to share, totally fine. So, uh, so someone said photos on Instagram, photos of a dog, memes, an invite to a community picnic, photos of your hibiscus. That's very specific. I literally don't remember the last thing I posted, but I do. So a Lego, reply to a tweet, videos of my grandson, so many, uh, lots of things. I'm going to zoom up so I can see. 
photo of your child on Facebook, news about a local artist. Yeah, so many things. How to sew your own face mask. We have a very active online community here. So that's interesting to see. Yes, Perth, there's smoky sunsets. That was us in Canberra last year. Um, and the beginning of this year, really. <laughs> Latest baking achievement, interesting. So all of these things coming up. And I want you to imagine that that one post was used to define you. So whether or not that post does define you, if that one post was around 30, 40, 50 years in the future, and that was how you were defined. So what does that one post say about you? It may not be an accurate representation of your personality. It could just be a little gripe you've had or something you've talked about, you know, offhand. But what if that was there as a permanent record? Would you be happy with that tattooed somewhere on your body? So when I talk about these digital tattoos, a lot of people go, oh, yeah, well, you know, I have a discreet little tattoo on my ankle. I don't mind that. But that's not really what we're talking about with digital tattoos. We're talking about full face tattoos, which is fine if you like full face tattoos, but we're not really involved in this choice. We're doing all these things. We're making these posts and doing this activity without being aware that all of this is a permanent mark on us. So the reason for all of this ta digital tattoos that are following us around is big data. So how many people here feel fairly confident in their online security, that their personal information is safe, that you know, they're not being targeted by ads? So how many people feel fairly confident with how conscientiously they use social media? So we've got some 50-50, that's, that's honest. Eight out of 10, mediocre, I like that one. 75%, I like this percentage thing. This is really helpful for me. Ooh, someone's got a 60, they've got some nice mathematical terms going through here, 80%. So people are fairly confident. Um, now I'm gonna show you some slides now that are going to kind of illustrate visually why big data is such a threat. And a lot of people go, yeah, but my stuff's just gonna get lost in the noise. There's you know millions of social media posts every day. You know, how are they going to find me? And big data is the answer to this. So here is my visual example, because I'm a very visual learner. <laughs> um, I've got this picture, which I love because it's the world's largest selfie. And it's at a time when people could crowd together, which is exciting. <laughs> um, yes, because uh, I would say Gmail and Yahoo Mail are definitely considered your digital footprint. Every single thing you email at work or on your private account uh, is part of your digital footprint. So this is the world's largest selfie. So I've got this nice little picture here and I've made up a fake character in this crowd. So don't feel like I'm invading this poor woman's privacy. I've just done this to illustrate. Um, so I'm going to use a tool called Amazon Recognition, uh, which is not as powerful as Facebook's deep face algorithm, but it's pretty powerful. Now I could use this if I went out to a pub and photographed someone surreptitiously, I could run their face through this and have all of their social media information and anything where that image comes up within seconds. So how that would work was I'm looking at this crowd. Now see this color scale down here on this side. Yellow is where it's pretty much definitely sure it has their social media profiles and blue is where it's not quite sure. So you can see how many yellow boxes there are in this one crowd shot. So I've made a fictitious character from this, Tracy Brazier. So searching, what can I find from her with this one app? I can find her children's names. I can find her husband and her father-in-law's names. I know she's recently been to the tennis and I know she has a dog named Cheddar. I also know she has a pool because Cheddar, lovely little Cheddar has um, his address on him right there, sorry. Um, so I can find her actual address within seconds. So I have a real world example of this. I found a lanyard walking home from work and uh, couldn't you know, locate who it was from on my, in my neighborhood. I put my 20 year old daughter onto it and within seconds, just through her little bit of use of social media, she found the woman's address because she had photos of her on Instagram holding flowers from her boyfriend and you could see her address on the flowers. So it took my daughter, who is a very tech savvy 20 year old, uh, took her about three minutes to find this woman's address. Uh, and so this is what an algorithm can do in much less time. So not only can it find her personal information like her husband and her children, 
It can also give a psychometric profile based on her tweets and her social activity, which is a bit more disconcerting, I find. So this is not an accurate personality test of Tracy Brazier. This is just what it's going, what the algorithm is determining from their social media activity. So by no means is this this person, but it does give an insight into it. And an employer can at any time do this to your social media accounts. Um, so this is run through an actual person named Tracy Brazier. Uh, and so this is their emotional style, social style, thinking style. And you can even run uh, vocabulary analysis to see what their commonly used words are, what uh, even a rating of their vocabulary and their intelligence based on what they tweet. Yeah, it's pretty terrifying. Doing it to yourself is particularly sobering. <laughs> um, and we've also seen things in the media where people have been fired, lost scholarships for their online activity. Yes, Penny, you might be saying a bad word. Yes. So um, sometimes a Twitter analysis of someone's Twitter account can show a swear word as their most, most commonly tweeted word. Um, so this first example, I have this slide full of news when I do this to scare students. And I, every time I teach this, I update it with more recent things because it's constantly happening. People are constantly losing out on major things in life because of their activity. So this is 10 students two years ago who lost full scholarships to Harvard for having a, a secret Facebook group where they just shared offensive memes. Now, to be fair, this group was actually a very culturally diverse group, and the memes they were sharing were about themselves, that they were sort of in an arms race for how offensive a, a post or a meme they could share. So they thought it was funny, and it was, you know, this sort of inside joke, but when the group was discovered, they all lost their full scholarships to Harvard. So you can imagine, like, the full scholarship to Harvard is a pretty, pretty much a golden ticket. So there's just constant examples of this. In the past election, we had two people fired for their social media posts. I don't necessarily condone what they've posted, but that's been a career ending thing for them. Um, this woman was fired for making an AIDS joke. Um, she made it on Twitter to her close group of friends before she left. She was actually an AIDS worker and was being sarcastic, but the comment was taken as incredibly offensive and she lost her job before she landed in Africa. Um, public servant made some attacks on the government on Twitter and lost her job. Yes, that, that is Kat Kane. And um, I would say having taught high school students fairly recently, I would trust them to find information way faster than any person my age. Um, yeah, so some doctors were speaking out about lack of PPE gear and they've lost their jobs. Uh, a nurse was fired for sharing how to make homemade PPE gear in Poland. Um, this MTV star made some comments about Black Lives Matter, which she said were joking. She lost her job. This person was pro Black Lives Matter and a police officer. They lost their job. Yeah, so it is really wild how many people have lost their jobs for it. And I obviously don't condone what happened at the Capitol riots, but they have used social media posts to identify a ton of people and they've lost their jobs for that. So you might attend a protest for something that you know, you believe in and that's fine, but it does risk coming back to haunt you at a later date. <laughs> yeah, um, so I also look at the political aspect. Now, a lot has happened in this space in the recent election where some platforms have stopped political ads. I believe um, Facebook only stopped it after the Georgia election. But how long they'll hold out on that, I don't know. So there's still a lot of culpability with social media and influencing us in elections. Um, you know, we've got, yeah, Trump, Trump, and now you can't look up Trump, which is a, a love thing. So this is an example of some of the ads that people were served up um, during the last federal election here in Australia about the secret plan to reveal a death tax. And they targeted these ads using people's social media information and all that stuff that they've readily provided to Facebook. So uh, in the chat here, have you ever done a personality survey on Facebook or anything like that? Like, are you a Hermione, a Harry, <laughs> or, <laughs> or Ron? Any one of those personality tests? Which Disney princess are you? You know, yeah, anyone ever done one of those? So those are essentially um, personality 
tests, tests for advertisers. So they serve up that information. So they can literally say, I want to send these anti-labor death tax ads to everyone who owns a ute and who lives within this geographical area. So by all that information we're posting and all those surveys we're doing, it means that advertising can be really targeted. And so that's what was happening here in this election. Um, and so this is the new development, which has only been in the last sort of week or so, where Facebook and Google have banned political or special interest ads. So that will be interesting to see how that pans out, but I don't know how long they'll hold off. Um, so I tell you all these scary things about election tampering and all the stuff that is available via social media, but I'm not telling you to bury your head in the sand, go analog and leave it all behind. You can actually engage online. It's just harder than we think. I sort of liken this to Australia and probably New Zealand as well. We are surrounded by ocean. We don't tell our children, don't learn to swim because you could drown. There's sharks, which are two very clear facts. We show them how to swim safely. We tell them what a rip is. We tell them where it's safe to swim. And that's the same thing online. It's developing conscientious digital practices and making decisions that reflect that and that are for your own safety. So that all being said, I actually quite like social media. I'm on a number of platforms, though admittedly I'm not on Facebook. As a primary school teacher, I made the decision to get off Facebook. And then after that fact, when a lot of the things about the political influence and the turning a blind eye to genocide came up, I sort of felt very confident in my decision to not use Facebook. But it does make it challenging for me to access things at my children's school uh, and other things because they are only on Facebook. So it is really frustrating. I like that quote, uh, Sharon, privacy is dead, deal with it. And I know a lot of young people sort of have that view, but I think that that sort of mentality is something I really want to avoid. We shouldn't be complacent about it because we can do things about it and we can advocate and vote in a way that um, reflects our beliefs in this area. Um, so this is my Twitter profile. If you are curious, this is uh, Tara Starbird. At Twitter, you can see some interesting things about it uh, down here. I was not born in Cape Denison, Antarctica, as cool as that would be. I was not born February 28th, 1889, which is the furthest back that I am allowed to <laughs> make my age. Um, but this is what I make it. I tend to make myself as old as possible, which is interesting because I get served up a lot of strange ads for like single cr singles cruises over 80 when cruises were a thing, and a number of products for people over 80, which is really nice. <laughs> Some funny um, things going on in the chat too. This will be my lunchtime entertainment reading. So I don't have a lot of followers. I do like using social media to connect with other librarians, with researchers, just to see what they're up to and kind of promote um, scientists and researchers that I think should be promoted. It says, my Sharon says she uses the same fake birthday for everything in case you have to remember it later. Yeah, I tend to use uh, this date in February quite a lot and yeah, never accurately. Uh, same with my name. So this one is Tara Starbird. Uh, I made it long, long ago, as you can see. I would prefer to not have it at that, but it's sort of already there. My middle name is incorrect though. My location is incorrect. A number of things are incorrect on it. And I always fill them in incorrectly. It's technically, not allowed under their terms of service, but I, their terms of service are uh, ridiculous. So I just kind of go with it myself. Um, so this is what we talk about, the good side of social media, the collaboration, the connection, especially in this time of a pandemic and distance. Um, haven't we all really relied even more on technology? Um, certainly my family's in Canada. I have friends in Europe, the States, UK, because they're not Europe anymore. Um, you know, it's been a really good thing to connect with people, to talk to lecturers and librarians all around the world and sort of share skills. So there is so much that can be benefited from online, um, but we need to adopt practices that can actually keep us safe. And it is possible. It's just a bit hard. <laughs> Uh, so this is the argument a lot of people tell me, but Tara, MySpace, it's gone. 
And I, yeah, exactly. And I'm, I love that my space is gone because I'm old enough to have had a lot of content on my space. And I was, I cried tears of joy when it was deleted because there was so much embarrassing 20 year old Tara stuff on there. Um, but, you know, not all things are like that. It's sort of hard to picture, but a lot of the stuff that you're posting today, liking, watching today will be around when your great grandchildren are no longer here. So, you know, I think I'd like to ask in the chat, how many people know the names of their great grandparents? This is my water cue. Yeah, oh, we've got a lot of people who know the names of their great grandparents. Some, yeah. How many people know the names of their great great grandparents? No. So they have an anonymity. Our great grandparents are part of us, they're part of our lineage but we don't know what sandwich they ate at the cafe that day. We don't know that they had that colonoscopy they tweeted about. <laughs> they have that anonymity. And I kind of see that as a beautiful thing. They have the right to be forgotten. So I don't need to be famous or remembered. I don't want my grandchildren to know everything about me. And we don't have that right anymore. So this comes down not to information, not to just privacy, but is privacy, is our personal information, is that a human right to have a right to be forgotten if we choose to be forgotten? And that is the EU legislation, yeah, the right to be forgotten. And we're being denied that basic human right because they know everything about us on a granular level. So what I want, if you want to take anything away from today is, Everything you post, comment on, email, even view, consider it entirely public. So that is everything from your super positive Facebook post to I'm so hungover presenting my thesis at noon. You know, that thing is going to be there forever. Now I'm, I'm 40, so I'm fortunate enough that my youth was misspent, but not documented. So I enjoyed my youth. I did very foolish, silly things, but just in that cusp of time before digital photography really took off. And I consider myself very lucky. But a lot of the students I've supported at postgrad and undergrad, grad, sorry, have had their entire life lived online. I spoke to a student whose mum was a mummy blogger and she had blogged the entire pregnancy and their entire childhood. So she even had the time she wet her pants in kindy blogged about. She had all her scans blogged about, everything in her life photographed and documented. And she came to me, I want to become a lawyer. What, how, did I, how do I get this off the internet? And there are ways to have some of it removed, but she had to work incredibly hard to have any shred of privacy in her life. So any boy that she met knew that she wet her pants in kindy. And you know th that's the kind of situation they're dealing with. I spoke to another student who had a shared Facebook account with his friend with both their names on it. His friend had gone alt-right and was posting racist, offensive things with his name attached to it and refused to give him access to it or change the name. So this is the reality of living digitally, particularly for our undergrads and, and postgrads because they are young. Even postgrads, we're getting postgrads who were born in 1998. Let that sink in. <laughs> they're young and they want to have some level of professionalism and they need to know what to do about that whole bulk of information that's online. So a lot of people say, but you know, listen, I use that software, it's convenient, I like it, so I make the choice. I have to accept the consequences. And that's a bit of that fatalism, privacy is dead. But I don't know that we really make a choice in this situation. So it's called the privacy paradox, if you're curious. Um, we're scared, we're deeply worried about our privacy, but a lot of people don't consider their personal information their own. And they don't really place a value on that, but the companies absolutely do. So a lot of people actually believe it's just the price we pay to access social media, YouTube, games, online shopping. Um, but just to let you know what that price is, is this is 2018 net revenue for Facebook. Uh, 55.8 billion. Google, 106.46 billion. This is US dollars. 
And then 2019, 69.7 billion, 134.81 billion. So they make this money by advertising to us as best as they can. So that's knowing all of our strengths and weaknesses so that they can target those ads at us. So the more they know about us personally, the more they can target an ad, the more they make money. So what wouldn't they do to make more money? So I want you to think about 10 years from now, which creepily is 2031 now, and these are old slides, obviously, uh, 2031. So what do our posts say about us? The us of today, the us of the future. Are your posts over the last few months a true history of you? Um, by all means, have a personality online, be out there, um, be an advocate, you know, you can protest things, you can have an opinion, um, but you have the power to control what information is out there about you. And in the session that I do with students, I go through with them how to lock down their Google account, how to download all the data that each social media platform has on them and to take control of their information, how to then try to you know, stem some of the flow of that. Um, so what I ask them to do is how do they make their digital footprint say the right things about them? And how do they make it more of a conscious choice? And that's taking control of your privacy settings, control of what you put out there, uh, control of yeah, what person is being displayed there and keeping your activity at bay. And I'm very aware of the time, I said, because this is a much longer session. Um, so again, like someone has said this in the chat and I, I have to say it to people again and again and again, that if a service software or platform is free, you and your data are the product. And that, that's billions of dollars, not small amounts I'm talking here, it's billions of dollars. So a lot of people say, what happens on social media stays on Google forever. And unfortunately, this is quite true. So what I really tell everyone to do is if you use Gmail, which is basically everyone, there are ways to get your data from Gmail and find out what information Google has on you. Now, I thought I was a pretty tech savvy person, but when I downloaded my Google data, I, I literally went pale. So it takes a few days for Google to send you the file, but it will have so much information on you that it, it's very sobering. And you can do this with Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. They're all now legally required to let you download the information they have on you currently. You are then allowed to request it to be deleted and to then lock down your privacy settings further. It doesn't mean that Facebook doesn't have it on a, process, a server somewhere, but it is something you can do. Uh, so what Google knows, uh, the typical stuff, your name, gender, date of birth, phone numbers, emails you've used, locations you, vis you visit, where you work, every Google search, online purchases, and ads you click on. The scarier stuff, though, was what came out was every movie I've ever looked up, every Google Maps location search, every website, every YouTube video, every place I've visited. And then it got really creepy because it was from 2011, was every illness I've ever Googled every medical practitioner I have ever Googled, um, every Googling of a new love interest or celebrity crush, it was all there. It also had the cost and you know, the date of created every single computer I had ever signed in from or device. So it knew that I had an iPhone. It knew that I signed in from both PCs and Macs and it knew the, it knew the cost of those machines. So it instantly made an assessment about my wealth level and a number of things about me. So, you know, really what couldn't they identify about me from all that? It knew the types of videos my children searched. So it knew that I must have children roughly these ages. You know, it was really, really distressing how much. Yeah, Kim, that's great. I use DuckDuckGo now. <laughs> but in 2011, I did not. So it was really good to say what sort of Google knows. Facebook, I really recommend downloading everything that Facebook has on you. It is um, wild. <laughs> so yeah, the I will, I have some instructions in a handout I give to students. So if you do nothing else for your privacy, download what all the companies have on you so that you know your digital footprint. Um, again, they just know a lot about your personality and they can then target ads. Absolutely. Specifically. Could you put the instructions? Yeah, I can put those on Liz. I've got sort of 
a whole sheet for students to go through on protecting their privacy. Um, so again, I'm looking at the time and very mindful of things, but I do have some ways to protect yourself from Facebook that will be included in the slides. I don't like Facebook. I draw the line long ago before using Facebook, but I know a lot of people do. Um, Twitter, I do use Twitter, but I use it carefully, you know, managing my identity. Um, yes, you can do that and then quit, yeah, quit Facebook. It's, I would say if you are going to delete any social media accounts you have, another fun thing to do is to remove your name, like change your name, change all your personal details, remove as much content as you can, and then delete it just sort of buries it under another layer. So I've advised students who are deleting their accounts to just do that extra level of deleting. Um, so when we look at Tracy Brazier, I've got the links in the slides of how to analyze your own social media footprint. It can be quite sobering. Uh, I put mine through this morning because I haven't in a while. And it turns out I tweet about the word pandemic a lot. So, and not just because I love the board game, but I guess it's sort of something we're all tweeting about whether we like it or not. Um, so I'm going to make um, a genuine effort to not tweet the word pandemic because there's other things happening in the world. <laughs> um, so yeah, definitely check this out for your social media, for your friends, it's really interesting. Um, so this is something you can do also called follower wonk. And this is an old um, screenshot of mine, but it just sort of gives analytics for your own account. And any employer can put you through this particularly if you're working in corporate, they spend hundreds of dollars doing a full scrape of your social media and they will have everything, every post. They can even identify how many posts you've sweared in, what time of day you post. So are you posting during working hours? Are you spending too much time on social media? Um, so there's a lot of reasons people get hired and fired or not hired. Um, and that can be found here. So um, this was mine earlier, you know, Australia media students, pretty boring. Um, it looked up my vocabulary diversity, average syllables. <laughs> Damn, you wish you swore more on the internet. Yeah, I still from teaching, I feel like I can't swear on the internet because if my students came across it, but um, yeah. Yeah, so it's interesting. So this one tells, you know, how often I tweet per day and how many minutes I spend per month. I've looked up people I know out of curiosity and this number has been hundreds of minutes a month, um, you know, and that can be quite disconcerting for an employer looking at that. Um, so this is all free stuff that you can find, but if you were going into a environment, just know that they'll do this and more. They'll know your blood type. They'll know, you know, the dogs you don't like, the things you, you know, it's wild what they know. Um, so these are the links that I recommend checking out on your own accounts, on your friends' accounts. It's all freely available. So we surveil ourselves. So it's all out there. Um, these are uh, links I'd like people to know about. Sorry, I'm looking at the time. I've got, what, two minutes? <laughs> um, exactly. Sharon said a comment about pug dogs. Exactly. You have an opinion about it, but someone who's hiring you loves pug dogs and just goes, well, I won't hire her. You know, you just never know. So Just Delete Me is a great site that links you to every social media, every sort of platform, and gets you straight to their delete section. And it tells you how hard it is to delete from that particular platform. So it's a really nice direct way to delete a bunch of your accounts at once. Have I been pwned is just a really good way to know if your email address has been compromised. Uh, my mom has been like massively hacked. So I will often demonstrate with hers because it just comes up, hack, 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 hack. Um, you know, yeah, my mom was even, um, you know, was taken advantage of like they got into her bank accounts because she still had the password admin1234 when I set up her account in 1997. Because <laughs> my mom's a very trusting Canadian lady who was, oh, no one will harm me. And, um, and they did, they took $20,000 of her investments and emailed all her family and friends to say she had been mugged and needed money. Please just forward it to this account, which then hacked your computer and did the same thing. So yeah, please check your addresses regularly. And if one has been attacked, go in and change all the details on your passwords. Yeah, it's pretty awful Joe, but it's not an uncommon story. Um, so beware the apps. I'm very mindful of time. So you can check these out later. Apps are really notorious for selling your data to third parties, sharing them willy nilly. And it's very intimate stuff, particularly if you have health apps, dating apps, it can be, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Pauline. People have said that 
they say, Tara, I leave your session pale and nervous. I'm like, well, good, because we can do something about it. <laughs> um, these are slides from my old Prezo that I didn't have time to update, as you can see, but I've just put them in. My really bad digital footprint stuff, um, good for young people particularly, like that friend who had neo-Nazi ties with his old friend. He needed to be more proactive and get that stuff off his name because that's, you know, that's nothing he wanted associated with. And he was just horrified. So here's some tips for that. Keeping your private life private. One thing I will just say is don't use apps on your phone for social media. Go to the website, but the apps just scrape everything on your phone. Every call, every GPS location, every text. That's what you're giving them permission for. They can turn on, you know, anything. So I would just say, do not, you know, I want a stupid phone now. <laughs> Fair enough. I will say that not endorsing Apple products, but there is more security on Mac computers and iPhones because they're not like an open source everything like um, the Android phones are. So there is a lot more security in Mac and uh, Apple devices. <laughs> so if you're privacy paranoid, you'll usually see someone with, with a, um, an iPhone or a Mac. <laughs> Um, so inexpensive ways to protect your privacy, um, a password manager, because admin one, two, three, four is not your friend. And it's really hard to remember 20 million long passwords Two factor authentication is, is a great idea. Just like your bank uses a VPN again, do your research. If your VPN is free, you are the product. And most of the free VPNs are super dodgy and scrape your data like nothing else. Brett, uh, a VPN is a virtual protected network. I have one here. It's basically like a little gateway between the internet and you. So it gives a false IP address. So we use a VPN to access Netflix from other countries because sometimes the content, we run out of stuff here. So we switch to British. Um, it tells the internet you're in a different location. So I really recommend a VPN. Uh, encrypted messaging and browsing like DuckDuckGo, not, not necessarily using WhatsApp and things like that. And a paper shredder, good old fashioned paper shredder uh, to protect your privacy. Yes, all these slides will be shared and I'll send along my handout as well. Um, one, the last thing I'm very mindful of time <laughs> is please don't be fatalistic, don't give up. There is so much you can do to combat the surveillance economy. That's a billion dollar industry. So on a personal level, turn off your location services. Don't allow apps to, location, to lo locate you unless you trust them. Um, don't post personal information and identifying details. Don't say you're going on holidays. You know, I don't post any photos of my kids because I sort of want them to have the choice of anonymity. And we have a very unusual name. So there, it's going to be an uphill battle for my children. Um, ask friends or family to delete photos and posts that you don't like. So if they've got a, one of you eating cake, which people love to do to women for some reason, tell them get rid of that cake photo, mum. It's embarrassing. Um, so really ask people to use the correct etiquette. If you are going to take a photo and post it online, ask people, is it okay if I post this online? Some people say yes and some say no. And I just think we need to put that etiquette into our lives. Be respectful of everyone's privacy as much as you would your own. So please don't give up is my last one. Uh, fatalism is the enemy of change. So believing that mass surveillance is normal will you know, be the death of privacy. And I believe that privacy is a human right. So on a societal level, notice surveillance and talk about it. When you see that you know, those loyalty cards, they are there for a reason to know all of your movements and all of your purchases. Notice it in CCTV cameras, notice it in cafes, talk to people about it. And so make sure you know that it's there and talk to people about, isn't it a bit, why do they need to watch us here? Like, why is it here? It's creeping in and in. And if you are, feel strongly about privacy, organize politically. So I'm not telling you, yes, who to vote for or what platform, but look at what their privacy policy is. Look at the laws. The laws of Australia have gotten distressingly anti-privacy in the last 10, 15 years. And, you know, it's now illegal to, for a journalist to report negatively about the government. In theory, they can be held without question and not be able to discuss it once they're released. So please look up the legislation for yourself. Don't just take my word on it. Privacy is slipping in this country and vote accordingly if you are passionate about it. Um, the internet is forever. 
there are steps you can take to stem that flow and to have a professional identity online, but be mindful of your privacy. So thank you. And I can answer questions for like two minutes. I don't know how much, how many minutes do we have before break, um, Sarah? We got five minutes, all good. I'm, I'm sorry. I just want to make sure you guys get the actual break because screen exhaustion is a thing. Any specific questions? Yeah, feel free. <laughs> You're really awake now. <laughs> Nice. So yeah, if there's any questions about sort of a specific thing, but yeah, there's instructions on how to get your data from all the sites. Yeah, and just be really mindful. Um, really fun anecdote while people are saying thank you, and I really appreciate it. Uh, a woman who was very appalled by the Capitol riots changed her Tinder profile to be a conservative Christian instead of liberal, you know, sort of out there person and changed her photos a bit and started getting all these men hitting on her who were conservative. And she would say, hey, were you at the Capitol riots? That would be you know, so cool. And they would say, yeah, here's the photos. And then she turned it over to the FBI. It's great. It's beautiful <laughs> and daring. But you know, she, they were all sending photos that the FBI hadn't found because they hadn't posted them, but they were really keen to prove to this woman how conservative they were. And so she's responsible for multiple men being charged because they sent photos of themselves inside the Capitol building. And I, you know, no condoning what they did, but our, our footprint, our information will be around long after we are. So we need to sort of learn to live in the world that unfortunately where that exists. It is catfishing, Dem. I agree that it's wrong, but it's also a little bit neat. <laughs> oh, good. Well, I might wrap up then and I will um, get the links up to Sarah, Sarah sorry, as well. Um, but have a great day, everyone. I wish I could tune in, but I'm off to another one soon. <laughs> Thanks, Tara. That was I'll just excellent. Unshare. Yeah. Um, so in that case, if there's no more questions for uh, Tara, um, we'll have a 10 minute break and we'll come back in 10 minutes. Thank you, everyone. All right, I hope everyone was able to have a nice break, um, get up and stretch a bit, you know, have a bit of coffee and tea. So we're going to go into the second part now of the session. Um, so this part is the lightning talks. We're going to have four lightning talks in this next part. The first lightning talk, um, and actually all of today's lightning talks will focus on data literacy. So the first one, data storytelling, is by Masami Yamaguchi, librarian. Brett Parker, Senior Programmer and Software Support Officer, and Amanda Miyoto, Senior E-Research Analyst, all from Griffith University. The second lightning talk, Work Integrated Learning Project to Explore a Visual Representation of Searching Activities of the RMIT Community, is by Charles Barnett, Library Business Partner, Design and Social Context, Duan Huktam, Sam Morrison, AVH and Jeff Fan, all from RMIT University. The third lightning talk, Tableau, Data Viz Made Quick and Easy, is by Clayton Belitho, Research Outputs Data Advisor at La Trobe University. And the final lightning talk, The Accidental Order, One Librarian's Adventure with Python, is by Bruce White, Open Access and Copyright Advisor at Massey University. So let's start with the first one. I'll hand it over to you, Masami. Okay. So um... We're here to talk about data storytelling. Um, I've already been, we've already been introduced, so we can skip that part. And after the last talk, realizing my Brett's in space Twitter handle is probably not great, but it was created when I was a spatial ecologist. <laughs> and <right>. I'm, <laughs> sorry, I'm, I'm Asami. I'm a librarian from Griffiths University. And now I can't move. Oh, here we go. So uh, next to 10 minutes, we cover what data storytelling is and why it is important and what and how we teach data storytelling at Griffiths University. So over to Brett. Okay, so first of all, what is data storytelling? So researchers analyze data for insight and then they create information used to better our world. However, data by itself 
um, isn't what leads to change. Instead, it's the data storytelling that does. So simply put, data story storytelling is the practice of building a narrative around your data and visualizations that convey this message um, in a strong and compelling way to your audience. So with this in mind, um, data storytelling is a combination of three key ingredients. So we have the data, we have a compelling narrative, and then we have visualizations that back that narrative. And together, these three ingredients um, explain, they engage, and then they enlighten the audience. So now, why is this even important? So um, as we probably know now, we live in the age of data. It's everywhere and there is a lot of it. So for example, each minute, Netflix users, users stream 400,000 hours of video, 350 Instagram stories are posted, and 42 million WhatsApp messages are shared. So this is each minute. This data uh, and all of the other data that's available to us is packed with extremely important information. Researchers are generally amazing at extracting meaningful information from this data, but um, it can be really hard to get this message across to the people who are capable of actually enacting the change. This is um, generally because they have not created a narrative that captivates the audience. So instead they rely on the data and statistics, which makes perfect sense to them. The problem here is that 63% of people remember a good story while only 5% remember the statistics. So data storytelling is about creating a narrative for the data. So that's the emotion, the importance, the memorability of it. Basically, you want people to walk away saying, we need to do something about this now. So at Griffith, we hold our regular data storytelling workshops for our academics, and this includes the PhD students. And over the next couple of slides, we're going to show you sort of the process of how we teach it and some of the key things that we teach in it. So we teach them how to turn data into story. A story is brought together by data, visuals, and narratives. Data is the basis of research, where researchers derive their insights. Data starts off as numbers and letters, but by exploring the relationships between data, information is created. This information is great, but explanation is needed. That creates knowledge. And this is what researchers want to share with people. The main objective of this data storytelling workshop is for participants to be able to use appropriate visuals with a catchy narrative to communicate their research with wider audience. We introduce a couple of techniques and show lots of different visualization examples throughout the workshop. As we want participants to think beyond the standard line graphs and pie charts, visualization examples we present include a Gapminder video by Hans Rosling. This is a masterpiece of storytelling and a photo comparison before and after 2011 flood in Brisbane. Google Earth time lapse. And pea shoot growing video, which is quite therapeutic. And a visualize your thesis competitions winners one minute video. So all resources we use for this workshop are freely available in public. We run a couple of group activities and hands-on exercise to meet the objectives of the workshop. Activities make the workshop interactive, dynamic, and fun. We try uh, our best to keep this format, though we deliver the workshop online since last year. Now we touch on activities we run in the workshop and how it helps participants storytelling skills development. Okay, so um, the first exercise we run is um, 
is about the narrative and how much it depends on the audience. So the audience could be lawmakers, they could be general public, they could be funding bodies, or they could be other researchers. So for example, a politician will remember the economic impact of climate change, while a farm will remember the operational impact to their farm. So they're, they're quite different stories that they're gonna remember. And researchers need to frame their ideas with their audience's view in mind. So what we do is we ask participants to explain their research to their grandparents and then to an expert in their field. So it's about the language that they use. Um, if they're talking to their grandparents, they're not gonna use highly technical terms as they don't want to lose them or make them feel silly. In contrast, if they're talking to a, another expert in their area, they're gonna get straight into the nitty gritty and they're probably gonna use lots of quite technical terms um, because there's no point boring them with the basics that they already know. So the way this works is we break them up into groups of about four and we get them to go through that exercise together. And then we'll come back as a central group and we get someone from each group just to share what they are uh, presented. And then we uh, have a little discussion around it. So we introduce storyboarding technique to organize a story and its focus together with visuals. Then we run a group activity overarching what participants have learned from the workshop. It is about Dr. Ignas Semmelweis, who found out why so many mothers were dying of childbed fever. Unfortunately, uh, he failed to communicate his important finding with his peers because he was a poor storyteller. So we create a better story with visualization on his behalf and present to demonstrate how convincing his message could have been. Okay, so in conclusion, data storytelling is a very, very, very important skill for researchers to have. If they can turn their data and statistics into a tailored narrative that kept, captivates their audience, then their chances for success and making an impact will be significantly improved. So. So yeah, this is what and how we deliver data storytelling workshop at Griffiths University. We would love your feedback and we are more than happy to share our workshop slides with you. So please contact us even for a casual conversation about the data storytelling or whatever. So thank you very much for your attention. Um, I guess if there's we got a little bit of time, if there's questions. So we've got uh, one question that's come through from Michelle. Um, what are some of the open source data viz tools that you use? Uh, so I think we have a range of tools. Some of them require coding and some of them don't. Um, I think the best one, is it open data viz? Data2viz is really good. Data2viz, um, yeah. For qualitative data, we do do a quick demo as well on Buoyant, which Masami might want to talk about for a sec. I can show you. Oops, oops. Stop sharing once. Oh, right. So this one here, data to viz, is quite a good one. Yeah. Um, open data viz. Um, just 
Now the data to viz is really good. I'm just going to quickly share it out. Yeah. The website. Okay. Yeah, so this is the data to viz website. And one of the really cool things is you can go to explore. And the first thing is you can see, it asks you basically what type of data do you have? So numerical, categorical, a mix, maps, networks, time series. And then from there, it's like a big tree diagram of all the different types of data you can use. I mean, all the different types of graphs that you end up with, but the data that you have as input to get there. So say if you, for example, if you only have one set of numerical values, then histograms or density plots. If you've got two, and then is it ordered or not? So this is really cool because it kind of helps you when you go from you know several thousand different types of visualizations, it can really narrow down visualization. And then if you click on it and go down to the bottom, it will actually give you code. So if we say for R, Is it? it will give you the code to create that graph to get through a little bit. Yeah, and you end up with the code. So you could put that straight into R and change some of the variables to match your data. And you end up with a really, really nice graph. Thanks, Brett, um, Masami, and Amanda. That was um, an excellent lightning talk. We'll just move on to the next one now. Um, so the second lightning talk, Work Integrated Learning Project to Explore a Visual Representation of Searching Activities of the RMIT Community uh, is by Charles Barnett, Duan Huk Tam, Sam Morrison, AVH, and Jeff Fan. I'll just um, hand you over to Charles now. Thank you. Hi, folks. I hope you can hear me. Um, I'm assuming so, and I'm hoping you can see my screen there. And I've got to say, um, uh, just from the get-go, that um, uh, Tam, Sam, Avi, and Jeff aren't with us. It's just me, I'm afraid. Um, so you haven't got the expert students. Um, I just wanted to say uh, thank you and a very quick um, acknowledgement of country, if I can, just pay my respects to the Wadarong and Eastern Ma people on whose lands I'm working from today. And yes, I'm just going to quickly talk about a data visualisation tool or project that was co-built at RMIT with some students from computer science. Just step through what we did to, um, to uh, get this up and hopefully you know, maybe show that while we didn't necessarily have some of the digital capabilities to undertake this sort of thing in the library, our, our community certainly did. And, and maybe being, being able to recognise what you don't know, um, sort of identify the gaps and being creative in the way you respond, might, maybe that's got a bit of a, that relates to digital dexterity in some way. So the story, um, um, basically back in 2019, the library established what's called a, a WILL project. Many of you will know what that is. It's a work integrated learning project for some final year computer science students with the idea to explore a visual representation of the searching activities of the RMIT community. This developed, um, well, it culminated, I suppose, in the development of a tool. Um, that you can see there on the screen, screen called Library Live. Well, the students called it Nebula um, and we branded it locally as Library Live. It's really important to note, some of you will think that's quite familiar with a tool called Unstacked, which was developed out of the State Library of New South Wales by Adam Hinshaw and Alyssa Lee. Indeed, it was um, inspired by and borrows heavily from Unstacked, but, but the architecture is very different. Um, and of course, um, the code for Nebula is freely available. It's licensed under a general public license version three. It's on GitHub, so you can you can bring it to your library. While I'm talking about um, this, in fact, I should step back. Um, they're they're the fellows that aren't here with us, I'm afraid, but they're the they're the creators. So we have um, Tam, Sam, Avi, and Jeff. 
um, from left to right there. This is the tool in real life. I'll just step you through it quickly. It really is a, a kind of a, a real-time glimpse into the searching of our discovery layer. Primo it works directly with Primo. Um, it, it's complicated in the way it works, but, but essentially um, Nebula uses Google Analytics to register when a record has been viewed in, in Primo in, in a in our discovery layer. It then uses a, an API call to get the records metadata information, which is fed into a library live visualization of recently viewed items. In fact, there's a lot of information about Nebula in the about column here, um, including links off to how you can um, access the code on um, GitHub. Uh, I'll just close that for a moment. It, each tile represents a resource that somebody has clicked on. So I, I, sh I should make that clear. This is not a, a tool that shows searching really. It, it kind of shows discovery. People will search for items when they click on an item record, it'll appear here. Um, it's real time, as I said, but it, but it is possible to filter those records for a particular date and um, a, a, a snapshot duration as well. So when I say a snapshot duration, what you're seeing at the moment is a snapshot of 300 of the last 300 minutes of searching at RMIT. During the year when it's busy, when there are students actually in using the tool, you probably 300 minutes would be way, way too much information. You'd set it back to 30 minutes. It's possible to do some other filtering as well. So you can filter by, um, by resource type. Uh, 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 that, that'll allow you, for instance, just to show um, records with images only, and which is nice if you want to show um, book covers only. Um, generally, I would have it on everything. It's also possible to filter by resource type. So you can filter by just books or um, just databases or any combination of, of those if you wish. Um, and again, I would select all of them. Uh, we did play around with some other ideas with this tool. Um, for instance, um, well, you can see if I click on one of these titles, um, you can see where the item was viewed from. So it would be possible to filter this by geolocation. Um, there were some privacy issues with that. While I'm in this record, I should say you can you can click into the item record back in our discovery layer in Primo. It'll take you to the record. So it is a kind of discovery tool. Um, it's possible to. Um, it, it, we did explore the idea of uh, filtering by subject, but that's complicated with the various resource descriptions we have. Somebody mentioned Dewey, but of course that's not really relevant, as you know, Dewey doesn't sit with. Uh, our e-resources e don't have a Dewey classification, of course. There was some talk of applying musical notes to the resource types so that this screen would be uh, kind of singing to you, I suppose, <laughs> as, um, as people clicked on different resources. And of course, um, the layout, we've talked a lot about working with our design students to, to rework the display and make it look better. So that's basically the tool. Um, and how it came about, um, and this is where um, there were a whole lot of other characters in the story, more, more people in the village, I suppose. Uh, it initially started with a colleague of mine who was at RMIT at that stage, now with Uni of Melbourne, Anna Clapworthy, who showed me Unstacked. We liked it, we wanted to roll it out in the library. Seems, <laughs> seems simple, but it wasn't. Um, so we didn't have the skill set or the capacity, I suppose, to time in the library. So we identified that gap. Another colleague of mine, Amelia Rowe, reached out to some contacts in the State Library of Victoria and the Primo users community to discuss Unstack. Um, and, and I was aware of a, uh, something called the, the VX Lab at RMIT. Um, the VX Lab is a, uh, it's a, it's a space for students in industry to access advanced technology and expertise around data visualization, but also robotics, VR and AR, pretty amazing space. I hope we can keep it, looks like we can. Um, I was aware of that through a makerspace development I was involved in. Um, and I had a chat to the manager there, Ian Peak, who was very interested and he suggested we set up this, this Will project with computer science students. So a brief was developed by myself and Amelia 
and was presented uh, to the students in computer science via the computer science um, staff. Um, students elected to take on the project, uh, a will contract was signed and the project was started. Some things in the will contract included things like um, making sure the, the product was open access as was Unstacked. Um, some IP and commercialis commercialisation issues were addressed in the, the brief and the will contract, but that was explored a little bit further as we went down. And in fact, the project, exploring the project through an agile or running the project as an agile approach, is, which is what the computer science students did, it was part of their project, with regular stand-ups, retros, etc., was a great way to go. It allowed us to, to invite um, the client, and I'll explain that in a moment, but it really led to refinements, allowed us to redirect, make some significant changes. And I can see why using an approach like that is important in this sort of area. Uh, it's not surprising that Agile was, was built out of um, computer software development. Of course, there are some other library staff and other university staff involved. I've involved, I've, mentioned Amelia Rowe and the VX manager Ian Peake. There was a research and innovation expert who had some expertise in data visualization, um, Ian Thomas, who was critical in supporting the students. Some other key people involved or stakeholders, at least that, that I mentioned client before, it was really important to have a client representative that was different to myself or Amelia. So we had Alison Bates, our associate director and David Howard, the director of the library come in at some of the retros and specific meetings as clients. And we also had to drag in RMIT legal at some points to discuss some stuff around attribution for Unstacked in particular, and to discuss some issues around commercialization for the tool, which, which has definitely has some application, but it's also complex. Um, it, it's built to work just with um, Primo, Ex Libris Pro, ProQuest product. So, Anyway, I won't go into that, but that was relatively complex. So that's the, the tool and the story. The next thing I wanted to talk about was um, the sustainability bit of this. Um, we, do, we do have some problems and the sustainability bit is very important. We, we certainly had that as part of the brief um, to the students. Uh, you know, there had to be a user manual and some training for library staff, but I think, and I think it was more me than anybody, we were all caught up in seeing the tool actually work and making some changes, making it look pretty. We kind of um, uh, dropped the ball on that one. So we, at this stage, we do not have a library staff member who's ready to keep this tool up and running. We, we have an, an issue with hosting. Um, it's hosted on a computer in the VX lab at the moment. We, for some reason, there's some complications about getting it on an RMIT server. It doesn't need to be hosted on an internal server, just so you know, it, it's, it, 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 it can sit on an external server. It just uses Google Analytics and, and Primo, so they're both cloud hosted. Um, it doesn't take up a lot of space. There's not a lot of privacy issues or risks, but I think ITS are a little bit worried about risks. And I think, um, but I think it's more around who keeps the thing up and running, does the troubleshooting. So there are some issues that need to be dealt with regularly. There are buckets within the tool that need to be emptied on occasion. There are Primo updates, of course, that may may impact on, on the tool and that needs to be considered, tested, checked, for instance. Um, what I've got on the screen there is an example of a problem we had last week and, and Arvi, one of the students who I contact to fix things at the moment, which is great, he does that, but it's not, can't sustain that. He, his response to the problem was, uh, I was able to get into the jump box. It looks like one of the workers had a CPU link a leak and went run away. I've restarted it all and it should be back to normal in a few minutes. I don't know if any of you know what that means. I don't. So it is important that we have some digital capability to, to be able to do what looks like a relatively quick and simple thing, even though I don't understand it. So we have some options there. ITS can take on the tool and hosting. They'll probably charge us, which is okay, but they're a little bit reluctant. We could outsource the service, both in terms of hosting and support, e.g. the students could be paid. Um, that would be great, if there were, but there is a cost and it's complicated, certainly at this stage of uh, things. And of course, what would be great is to go back to the original idea and have library staff 
identified in their work and supported through training to um, take responsibility to look after uh, the tool. It's a nice way, of course, to build build some digital capabilities into the library. There's a cost to that, of course, but it's um, you know it's absorbed in staffing budgets. That's Kind of all I wanted to say, other than, you know, if you want to know more, there's some details about me. There's a link there to Library Live and a link there to GitHub where you can access the tool. If you're interested in any of those <laughs> seaweed photos, um, check out Dibray on Instagram. I think that's it. Are there any questions? Yep. Uh, thank you, Charles, um, for representing your team's work so well. Um, basically, we're just going to keep going. Yep. Uh, we're a little bit behind in um, the lightning talk, so we'll just go to the next one. If you do have any questions for Charles, can you please add it to the chat? Um, and then he can respond to you via that avenue, if that's OK. Um, so we'll go into the next one. So the third lightning talk is Tableau, Data Viz Made Quick and Easy by, by Clayton um, Belifo. So he's the Research Outputs Data Advisor at La Trobe University. So I'm just going to hand you over to Clayton. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm unmuted, so I'm hoping you can all hear me. I'm Clayton. Um, yes, I'm from Bendigo. And I've, I'd like to thank the organisers for the opportunity to talk here today, because if it was in normal times, I probably wouldn't have been able to do it. I've got a school pickup to do at, at 3.30 today, but it's great working from home. I can do that. Uh, my talk's about data viz, and um, <clears throat> this is, I'm really passionate about data viz. Um, in 2015, this, uh, I first came to look at this, and uh, I was really blown away. My life is, my, seriously, my professional life has never been the same since that time. Uh, prior to 2015, I was using Excel for everything related to data. And uh, suddenly I could see the data um, so easily in these graphs and charts and whatnot. And it really was simple. Um, <clears throat> since that time, data viz has come quite a, quite a way. And I'm aware that a lot of people may well be familiar with what I'm going to share. So for those people, you might not learn anything new here, but my lightning talk is more or less targeted to those who are completely new or just used to, used to using Excel to uh, examine their data. Uh, I've, I don't have a PowerPoint. I'm going to do a live demo because I love live demos. They're a bit risky, but I'll, I'm pretty confident it'll work. So um, the only thing I'm a little bit concerned about is lag. So if, if um, when, when I share my screen, please let me know if there's a lag because I need to be talking to what you're seeing. So <clears throat> here we go, share my screen. Right. So you should be able to see a spreadsheet um, and if I scroll down this spreadsheet, there are 35,000 lines. And um, so the spreadsheet's pretty simple. It's just a gate count of the um, Bendigo Library um, gate. Sorry, Clayton. I don't think we can see the spreadsheet there. We're just oh, seeing okay. the File Explorer. Oh, okay. Now let's thank Yeah, that's better. Uh, that's I haven't done anything really. Can you see it? Yes, we can see it now. Thanks. Okay, that must be due to a lag. Okay, that's pretty significant lag. So anyway, we'll see how we go. So the spreadsheet's only got two columns. One is the date time element and the other is a person count. Um, if you were going to sort of get any meaning from this, it might take quite a bit of time to sort of organize it into a human friendly format in Excel. But I want to show you how to use DataViz to do this. I've chosen Tableau Public for this. Our university actually supports Power BI, but I'm very much on my L plates when it comes to Power BI, so not confident to, to show you using that. So I've gone for what I'm comfortable with um, in Tableau. <clears throat> and also Tableau offers the free product uh, Tableau Public, which I'll be using. So anyone can use that at any time. You don't require a subscription or payment like that. So it's also, it's, so it's very accessible. So, um, to show you in Tableau, I'll just get to open up Tableau Public. <clears throat> if you hear that bell, I live right next to a school. I don't know what you can hear, but um, 
the school bell just went. Uh, why isn't it? Okay, it's working. It's just giving a bit slower than normal. <clears throat> I didn't want. Okay. Now, can everyone see the Tableau public um, screen yet? Yes. Fantastic. So to connect to that spreadsheet, I just click on Microsoft, Microsoft Excel to connect. I choose the spreadsheet, open that up. I've chosen a, I've deliberately chosen a fairly simple spreadsheet with just two columns. It, it, it's fantastic to do this with more columns, but I, for the purpose of a lightning talk, I want something simple. This is just a sort of a data loading screen. Um, to get to the actual Tableau interface, I just click on sheet one. It's kind of like Excel in its, in its worksheet tabs down there at the bottom. Can you all see sheet one? Or is yes. it okay? Fantastic. So to get um, to get something from this data, I, all I do need to do is put date, time, and column, person count in rows, and um, I have a a line chart. I can change that to a bar chart because that's what I want to look at, and I'll just fill the screen. So um, change the view to the entire view and some labels might be good. So if I drag this person count onto the label panel here, <clears throat> I can get the number of pe uh, people. So straight away, we can see um, the annual um, gate count for the Bendigo Campus Library at Latrobe. Now, if I want to see months, that's easy to do too. Here, if I just click on the drop down on the year, I can actually change that to months. And it's straight away I get months. And I <clears throat> actually I'll go back. If I do a control Z, Tableau, Tableau is great like this. You can you can play around. I want to rename that actually, and I'll call that years. And um, you can see the titles come up there, and I'll duplicate this so I can come back to the years quickly, quickly, and I'll call this one months. And I'll change this to months. And if I want to get the days of the week, again, I'll just duplicate it um, so I can keep those, the other one, two I've done. And I'll rename this to weeks, weekdays, sorry. And I can change the time up here more to weekdays. So <clears throat> I'll just, you can see that um, it follows a pattern you might expect. Fridays, of course, um, it drops off significantly. And this, this actually shows it in the data. Um, you might sort of be aware of it in your head, but there's nothing like the data to show what, what is actually happening. And it's really that simple. Um, there's another Tableau, uh, well, DataViz also, all the DataViz um, programs I've used also allow you to connect to other data and what I wanted to do just briefly is to connect to another spreadsheet um, which has the, has the open days. This is just a single column of dates and I can link that, um, that second spreadsheet. If I go back to the data source and I'll just click on that and add a second spreadsheet which is the open day dates. And I want to connect date time to date. Now one's a date time value and the other's a date. So they're not compatible. So I need to change the date time to a date. And I can do that pretty easily. I can just put date, all part of the date time, connect that to the open day date column in the other spreadsheet. I'll do a left join because I want all dates to be included. And now if I go back to the years, I can, it's, I can create a filter for this Bendigo date 
uh, time for, sorry, not the, I want the open day date. I'll create a filter for the open day date. And if I get rid of the nulls, and I'll just change this to a, um, uh, no, that's right. This gives me the open uh, day counts for those um, dates in August of each year. So it's, it's really quite simple there too. If you want, um, the other thing I just want to quickly show you is if you want to compare years, um, you can do that by giving each year a different uh, colour and convert it to a line chart. And to do that, if I just drag the date time to colour and I'll convert, actually, it's not useful to do that with years. Uh, I'll do that with weekdays, actually, sorry. Um, date, time, and colour. And then I'll change the type from a bar chart to a line chart. And this gives the, each year um, to see whether it's um, changed over the years. This purple one at the top is 2018. So um, in 2018, there were more, there was more um, weekend usage, probably due to a change in the weekend opening hours at that time. But that's how quick and easy it is. And um, that's basically what I want to say. I just want to finish off my talk by just briefly mentioning um, some of the things that, uh, some of the ways which data viz is being used at, in, at La Trobe. So um, <clears throat> one, uh, way that data, uh, the collections and access team have been looking at um, the usage of online resources through DataViz and DataViz can really help guide decisions as to which resources we can maybe discontinue using, which, which resources are popular and good value for money. Um, a second uh, thing, way in which DataViz is being used at La Trobe is with the uh, RAVE reports, which is that RAVE report start, stands for Research Attention Value Engagement, which the, um, the research partnerships team compile up for researchers. It's like a research impact statement. And it's really useful to have that visual element and it's been really popular. And um, that team the, the, uh, has been using that visual element in their research impact reports for a few years now. And as I said, it's very popular. And the other one I want to mention that I know about is my own team. I'm in scholarly publications and we um, have to compile reports um, of open access usage as, and also our assessment. We, we assess the ERA pub, publications for ERA eligibility and we provide regular reports and we use DataViz to get those reports. So it's been really useful and I guess the main point I'm wanting to show you here today is that you can, you don't need to know programming necessarily. You don't need to be super duper human with all this expert knowledge. Um, all you need to do is load the data, click the um, data in the re relevant column and rows, play around with it, and you too can see, um, get, get a nice visual summary of your data in just a few quick and easy steps. So once again, thanks for thanks for allowing me to sh share that with you today. I've really enjoyed that. Thanks, Clayton. Uh, that was an excellent um, presentation to show how data viz can be made quick and easy. Um, so just for the next presenter, we'll be going into the break at around uh, 2.20 Australian Eastern Standard Time. So. Um, I guess we'll just need to quickly go through the final one, which is The Accidental Order, One Librarian's Adventure with Python um, by Bruce White, Open Access and Copyright Advisor at Massey University. I'll hand it over to you, Bruce. Um, but yeah, we do need to wrap it up at about 2.20 um, Eastern Standard Time. Thank you. Okay, Kota Koto, I will talk quickly. Um, I'll share my screen. Uh, just tell me if you can see that. Uh, are you seeing my yes. um, my PowerPoint? Yes. Okay, good. Okay, this is me, um, Massey University in New Zealand, um, and that's today's date. Um, I've just got to work out. Okay. Um, 
the, the situation that we had 2019 Consul Open Access Project, um, Consul Council of New Zealand University Librarians, and they, they um, Kim Tyree, um, you may have seen us a bit, been a bit chatty um, this afternoon. Um, Kim and her cohort came up um, with this request for an open access project um, of an environmental scan of open access in New Zealand universities to get some rich data. Um, there was no single source that gave us the level of detail that we need. We needed to be able to do a mashup from a number of different sources, Unpaywall, Crossref, um, Sugar Row, Mayo, and we got some of it from uh, commercial databases. And this could be done by using APIs as a starting point. So um, here, is, here is the program. This is how it works. We've got DOIs were provided to us by the research repositories of all the New Zealand universities. We sent them off to three places, Unpaywall, um, Web Science and Scopus, um, and Crossref. And then we gathered all this stuff. We gathered all the bibliographic data out of Unpaywall. We got some author data um, out of, um, and funded data out of Web Science and Scopus. And we got, uh, author names, numbers of authors, and the citation counts um, out of Crossref. Uh, then uh, we got the, the ISSNs also, and we sent them off to, um, to, get a, to get data on article processing charges. We got some of this from Director of Open Access Journals and some of it from a GitHub site um, run by Lisa Mathias of the Free University in Berlin. And we got data on the archiving rights from Shipper Romeo, and we put those, and that all went in, into a spreadsheet um, it's a Python program. Creators now put a spreadsheet of um, nearly 13,000 records. Um, and this resulted in um, uh, this uh, beautiful infographic. So you've been um, uh, talking about um, uh, data visualization. I'm afraid. Uh, None of, none of the visualization was done by me, um, but it showed that 40% that of um, New Zealand academic publications in 2017 um, were, were open. Um, uh, uh, nearly 60% were closed, and, and we found a big citation advantage um, for green and hybrid OA. Um, and also it resulted in a, an article which is still in peer review. Um, so these are some of my colleagues on the project. Um, Richard White's the lead author from this. Um, and I'm the, the programming and data guy, I guess. Um, that hasn't yet gone through peer review. Um, only two out of five articles by New Zealand researchers are free to access. A multiple API study. Okay, then we went back and we tacked on altmetrics. So that's the same. Um, the same diagram and we realized, oh, okay, wouldn't be interesting to see um, if tweets um, uh, make an effect, media mentions and so on. Does openness affect how often things are mentioned in the media um, and how does that link up to citation? Um, I'm a spreadsheet person. Um, uh, this is this is my book published um, last month. So it's, a, it's available from all good libraries. Um, that's how you can tell it's a good library. Um, but buy a copy for yourself as well. Um, spreadsheets are great at organizing and analyzing, analyzing data, but not so good at capturing it. Capturing it. And uh, you, you need the spreadsheet needs to come from somewhere. And that was the gist of our, of our operation. Um, a number of years ago, a reviewer put me onto APIs in Python. Um, uh, in fact, he put me onto APIs. So I began working with some students who said, yeah, we can do this and with Python. This was for another project I had in mind, but we didn't get very far. And, and what Charles was saying, uh, I wasn't, a, a, this was just my own sort of research for, for publication. Um, uh, there's only so much you can ask of students. Um, and I realized that what I wanted was gonna be far too complex uh, to go back uh, for the, the Massey Coding Club. Uh, so they, they, they kind of got me started anyway, made me realize it was possible. Um, the accidental bit comes in. Um, I went to a conference in Adelaide um, uh, 2017. It's a beautiful photo taken um, uh, late November morning. Um, uh, that evening, I, um, I broke my hip, uh, which wasn't like, not an experience I can recommend. It was non-alcohol related. Um, 
So uh, that put me, I was kind of socially isolated before it was fashionable. Um, I had a lot of time on my hands and I got sick of um, reading about Donald Trump and thought, well, maybe I could, I could learn Python coding. Um, so Coursera is also a wonderful thing. So I went off to Coursera um, and um, got myself um, uh, um, educated myself. And whoops. Okay. Um, so is Coursera. Um, so was it worth it? Yes, it was. Um, the reason was that we could use multiple data sources. We weren't dependent on commercial. There are plenty of commercial providers of sort of research data and data on these things, but we weren't dependent on them. We could do a mashup ourselves. The ability to code allowed us to modify and build on the original idea. Um, so that, you know, we, we just started off trying to work out, okay, we'll use the unpaywall API, see how much of this stuff is open. And then it was, okay, how does this relate to citations? So we were able to build that in from Crossref. So we were free from other people's um, preconceptions. And, you know, it's, it's my view, I guess, that, that librarians need data skills all, of all the sorts that we've seen now, but right down to the very hands-on. And, and believe me, um, Python programming is hands-on. Um, uh, this is the yes, but it is time consuming. Um, and I agree with what Charles said that about sustainability, um, that, that I, I, I worry about that. Um, the data source has changed. So the code that we ran last year um, no longer works because of changes to the Shipper and Mayo um, uh, website, the way they're presenting um, and the data. Uh, it's easy enough to, um, to, to, to change, to catch up with that. It just takes time. Um, IT projects always, always need maintenance. I would suggest starting simple, um, invest time in learning the basics. I didn't always do that. Um, reinventing the wheel, I kind of believe in reinventing the wheel. I mean, the wheel is a great thing, but if you own a car, you realize all, all cars have different wheels. And the last one is document, document, document. And I don't know if any of my colleagues um, from the project are watching this, but they would laugh at hearing me say this because I haven't always done this um, as, as well as I want, as I should have done. Um, so that's it. I, th I think, Sarah, I did it in within the eight minutes. Um, so I'm not quite seeing the chat. Oh, okay, here's the chat. Um, okay. You did a fantastic job with timekeeping, thanks. Sorry? You did a great job with timekeeping, I'm very impressed. Yeah, well, you know, Yes, uh, in another life, I could have could have been a um, a race caller. <laughs> you, should, you should write a book. Thank you. Yeah, buy buy, buy my present one. Buy my book. Buy my book. <laughs> Thank you so much, Bruce. Um, so yeah. we have time for a five minute break, everyone. Um, unfortunately, we don't have time to ask any um questions at this point, but you can always put it in the chat, and we can get back to you. So after yeah. five minutes, I'm we'll have our final presentation. Um, sure. Thank you, I'm Bruce. Gonna, I'm going to have to go. Um, and okay. go but if, if people want to put questions in the chat now, I'll, I'll flip back answers for about the next 10 minutes or so if there are any questions. No worries. And for everyone else, um, yeah, if you don't have any questions, you can take a five minute break. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thanks for um, coming back after that really quick, short break. Um, so we'll go into our final presentation. But before that, I just wanted to mention that um, Sarah Davidson will be uh, linking and putting the link to the Google poll, the one that we would like you to um, fill in by the end of the session today. So she's going to just quickly put the link into the chat. Um, so if you could please fill that in, that would be great. So our final presentation of the day is Call Y O, Who Am I? Digital Identity and Wayfinding by Kim Tairi. Kim is the Kai Toha Puka or the um, University Librarian, and I hope I said that correctly, at Auckland University of Technology. Uh, thanks, Kim. I'll hand it over to you. I think you're on mute, Kim. Interesting. 
Uh, kia ora everyone. Uh, I just wanted to uh, acknowledge the Tangata Whenua or the Indigenous people of uh, Tamaki Makaurau, uh, their Tipuna ancestors and their Rangatira past, present and emerging and their continuing connection to the Whenua, the land and the why the water. I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional custodians um, of the place that you are today, their ancestors and leaders past, present and emerging. Uh, tina koto, tina koto, tina tato katoa, uh, ki ora e ho mahi, uh, kua hui hui mai nei e tenei rā ki te koreroero i nā kaupapa. Ka nui te hari i tō koutou mā ia ki te awhina i tēnei kōrero, nō reira e oku hō mahi, uh, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about uh, kōaiau. Uh, essentially I'm going to talk about why I still use social media despite all the things that uh, Tara outlined earlier in this session. Um, I'm going to talk about my own digital identity and social media platforms as performative spaces and then some things to consider when constructing your own digital uh, identity. I wanted to uh, share this uh, whakatoki with you, uh, which is um, some Māori wisdom, uh, because it encapsulates why I continue to use social media. So it's uh, kiti kotahi uh, ti kākoho ka whati, uh, ki te kapuia i kori e whati. Uh, and essentially it talks about if we stand alone, we're vulnerable, but together we're unbreakable. And for me, the reason that I continue to belong to social media is, is to build robust and diverse uh, social networks. Uh, it's really important in our profession to be connected to lots of different kinds of uh, professionals that are aligned with our work uh, with academics and to um, be globally connected as uh, librarians. I'm also really interested in the idea of having professional circles of kindness. Uh, if you're interested in professional circles of kindness, uh, I highly recommend following the uh, blogs Research Whisperer and Thesis Whisperer if you aren't already because uh, Sen Ku, Jonathan um, O'Donnell, uh, Inga Milburn, um, also uh, Narelle uh, Lemon from Swinburne, uh, uh, talk a lot about the importance of uh, support and kindness in academia and their whole ethos around uh, Research Whisperer and Thesis Whisperer is all about um, sharing and connecting. Uh, I'm really excited about building and being part of communities practice. So that's where uh, social media is uh, really uh, exciting for me still because my com communities of practice are in those spaces. In uh, Māoridom, we have this fantastic word called uh, whaka whanaunatanga, which means building relationships and creating shared experiences. And I've been able to do that through using different social media platforms. Uh, I follow a lot of people that inspire me, that challenge me, that I learn a lot from, and ultimately the uh, my interactions on social media are about um, communication. Uh, I use Twitter mostly, uh, or Tiho. Um, I have one profile to rule them all. Uh, I use my own name. And in my bio, uh, I also have a disclaimer about the views being my own. It's important 
but it isn't really any kind of protection if your social media presence is associated with your workplace as um, mine has become because I share a lot of my colleagues uh, work and I talk about what I do professionally and even though I'm not officially affiliated with my place of work my workplace is within its rights to uh, be concerned I guess um, about the content that I share on uh, social media. Um, I'm going to share a little story with you of something that has happened to me in a workplace. Uh, I also use Instagram uh, and I follow a lot of appearance activists, uh, people that talk about body positively. Um, I am quite open with what I share, I share lots of selfies. Um, I'm a uh, tattooed indigenous woman. I'm proud of that. And uh, so I, you know, I will share photos uh, that uh, some people, just like Tara was talking about earlier, may think or consider not appropriate. But I have a whole context and ideas and activism that sit around that. Um, I posted a photo that uh, a colleague considered inappropriate and they contacted uh, my workplace and uh, my boss called me into my office to have a very awkward conversation. And essentially the university's that I've worked in have always been aware that I use social media. Um, it is something that is part of what they get when they employ me. Um, but they also need to respond to other people's concerns. Now, I didn't have any problem with the image and a lot of my followers had no problem. But the issue with working in digital spaces is that things can be taken out of context. And, you know, although I found it challenging um, to be uh, asked to consider taking a post down, um, I often have put something up and questioned my own uh, rationale behind sharing content. So it's not to be unexpected that my workplace uh, at some point in my career would ask me to delete posts. Fortunately, it's only happened a couple of times, but one of the things that you need to be really mindful of is that your followers are not a reflection of who's looking at your tweets and posts if you have an open account and an open profile. So you don't know who's watching you. Uh, colleagues, your boss, your boss's boss, your arch nemesis, or nemesi, I don't know how many nemeses you have. Um, but if your account is open, unless you, you have made the decision to block those people, they may be looking at your content. So it's just something to be really mindful of. Uh, social media is a performative space. Uh, I know a lot of people will find this challenging, but as you know, the, uh, a lot of accounts are managed by marketing teams. Uh, there are multiple people sitting behind the accounts often. Um, with my account, you get me. Um, I try to be authentic, but I recognize that it is a performative space. I'm curating content. I filter my photos. I want to put my best foot forward. Uh, I, I don't think I mean, I thought quite a lot about this. I aim for authenticity, but you've got to recognize that it is a performative space and that whatever you do, people are going to come at it with their own lens uh, when they're looking at your content. So they have their own biases, uh, conscious and unconscious. And you just need to be mindful of that, uh, that you know, even if you're nice, uh, even if you're snarky, uh, you can guarantee that somewhere um, you're going to upset 
somebody, um, your content will, if you're going to be active in these spaces. So I try and act with integrity, intentionality, and mindfulness uh, in social media. You, as Tara was talking about earlier, when she was talking about managing your digital footprints and your privacy and your security, you can control your narrative um, uh, to a certain extent, but you've got to be mindful of the fact that people have their own way of looking at content and make their own judgments. Uh, Irving Kaufman, the uh, Canadian sociologist, talks about um, impression management and how we often, in workplaces and organisations, we try and manage our uh, impressions to present this idealised form that, that uh, people can accept uh, so that you can succeed in your workplace and your environment. And that research uh, has been applied to social media platforms where uh, you know people are managing their content and they are trying to control the narrative as much as they can. I don't get trolled very often. Um, it has happened a couple of times. Uh, if you're interested in how toxic uh, social media can be, it, I recommend having a look at, at the work of uh, Carla, uh, Carly Findlay, who's an Australian author and uh, appearance activist, and of uh, Clementine Ford, uh, who's an Australian writer and feminist. They have uh, people who actually abuse them in online spaces. And it's really interesting and inspiring and to see how these women respond to that kind of abuse and how they handle it with grace and uh, they take care of themselves in those spaces. And it's, it's really, really important. Um, a bit like crime, often trolling comes from people that know you personally. So you just need to be mindful of that. Um, social media spaces can be weaponized, um, particularly in the activist space, um, if you are political, um, if you talk about your politics, if you talk about your activism, uh, it will pick up trolls. I block often and I mute tags, especially tags that I may find triggering, uh, triggering. It's important to do that to protect yourself in these spaces. So when it comes to uh, digital content, uh, it's important to think about how you go about uh, managing and building your digital identity. If you're on lots of different platforms, I recommend using uh, an online profile like About Me or Linktree if you're on Instagram. Think about the voice that you're going to have, um, that you're going to use when you're interacting with people, the goals what you want to get out of it professionally, if you're active in these spaces, the platforms you want to use, uh, your values are really important when you're operating in these spaces, uh, the kind of content you're going to share and the frequency you're going to share it. For me, my digital identity is very much about sharing and connecting and building relationships. Uh, in Aotearoa, we have a fantastic kind of network of uh, library professionals that are very active in Twitter and also um, a kind of a very big circle of niceness. Um, I don't know if you've heard of uh, New Zealand Secret Santa, for example, that I think that is something that could probably only happen in New Zealand, where strangers sign up and they send gifts to people all over the country. It's just really, really wonderful. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about voice before I finish up, but essentially your digital identity is any visible content that you that is available out there on uh, the interweb and uh, beyond. So anything that is visible makes up part of your digital identity. And you know things like people tagging you, in photos and things like Facebook without your permission, particularly if they're, you know, things that you'd rather not share, those sort of things. So you just got to be mindful of that as well. There are lots of tools that you can use to manage uh, your digital identity. And a lot of the tools that Tara talked about earlier and shared are the same tools that you use, digital footprints, digital identity. Uh, I think it's really important to be intentional 
and mindful. You've got to make decisions about your privacy, whether you want to be anonymous, not. These interesting, interesting things about being anonymous, it allows you to do certain things, um, particularly there, there are some people that operate in the crit library space um, that don't feel safe. Um, I guess, uh, critiquing our profession without being anonymous. So that's an interesting space to, to think about, um, whether you want to have your accounts open or whether you want to have them private. Google yourself, just like Tara said, you'll be amazed what you find. Set up Google alerts to see who's searching on you and how they found you. That's always really interesting. Uh, review and clean up your content regularly. I, uh, I'm going to share with you two people that I really love to follow on Twitter. And the first one is Jane Cowell, uh, who is the chief executive of Yarra Plenty Libraries. And many of you will know Jane and her work. And one of the reasons why I really uh, love having Jane as part of my personal learning network and my professional network is that she lifts up the profession which is really, really wonderful. And she does that by building community, lifting up the people that she works with and the profession as a whole, which is really, really fantastic. And if you wanna see a case of somebody that manages their uh, digital identity really, really well, uh, Jane is a great person to have a look at. The other person that um, I adore, I don't know him personally, but I adore his digital identity is Chris Lawrenson, who is the Danish library and the co-founder of Library Planet. And in the same way that Jane lifts up the profession, uh, Chris lifts up librarians uh, and the profession and, and his own community uh, in a really uh, heartfelt, creative way. And there are so many people out there that are doing great work in advocating for um, our role in society and what we do. The, the other person I just want to mention briefly, but she's not on the slide, is uh, Donna Lankos, who is an amazing anthropologist uh, and academic who has worked with libraries for quite some time. And the reason why uh, I follow Donna and I find her digital identity uh, really, really interesting is that she operates in that um, crit lib uh, space, um, holds up a mirror to us as a profession and challenges us around some of the things that we aren't doing really well. And that's really important. And so finally, before I, um, uh, look at the chat and um, answer any questions is uh, when I decided on my voice for social media, it, it has actually evolved. It's been kind of messy um, since I've come back to Aotearoa. And uh, although I feel very Australian, um, I've embraced being back here and what that means. And my social networks have started to evolve and change because of my professional interests having changed too. So um, I follow a lot of people who are in the um, indigenous language revival space because I'm learning to speak uh, te reo Māori. Uh, a lot of activists in uh, the Māori world, um, indigenous activists, which I find really interesting uh, because in Aotearoa, we have a, a Titiriti, a partnership with the uh, indigenous people. Um, and that means something very special to us and um, all New Zealanders have got to be held accountable around that. So when Tara was talking about the things that we've got to be mindful of, my digital identity has changed quite a lot since coming back to New Zealand. But what I hope comes across are these things. Uh, kia atafai, being kind, and our Prime Minister uh, Jacinda Ardern talks a lot about being kind. Uh, kia whakahi, being proud, lifting up the profession, um, lifting up the organisations that you work for. Uh, kia mumura, being bold. I think as an Indigenous woman uh, in leadership, um, we're like rare Pokemon, there are not many of us, and uh, I'm proud of being visible uh, and 
having a voice in this space and social media allows me to do that. And then finally, uh, tapa tapa hiana, being stylish. And I think this quote from Christopher Marlowe uh, kind of sums up the way that my digital identity has evolved over the last 11 years. Uh, you must be proud, bold, pleasant, resolute, and now and then stab when occasion serves. So namihi nui ki a koutou katoa. Thank you very much for listening and i um, happy if I've got some time to answer some questions. Yep, we have about five minutes for any questions if anyone would like to ask any. <laughs> I'll kick us off if that's okay. A question I have for you, Kim, is that um, when you're thinking about a new grad and stepping into this space, do you wish that you had social media at that time in your life? Uh, no, to be honest. I think about that with um, my partner's children who have TikTok accounts and her on Instagram. And although uh, he has had lots of conversations about safety and privacy and those sort of things, there's such peer pressure. And I think with our new grads, uh, the social aspect of university is one of the best things. And, you know, you, you want to be social and social media is part of that. I think the things that Tara talked about uh, around uh, education and prevention are really good. I mean, all we can do is uh, help to educate people around looking after themselves and managing their reputations because it is it would be very sad if people's careers were limited, as Tara said, by inappropriate posts on social media. Um, there are there are services that can actually clean up your social media account, like professional services that can do that, but sometimes it's too little, too late. Uh, but we just need to be mindful and talking to our students and talking to our kids. It's a thing around helping them to be intentional and mindful. And look, sometimes you're just not going to hear it until you need to hear it, um, which is often with a lot of the stuff we teach our students. It's kind of like, oh, that's right. The librarian told me something about that. I'll go and see them again. There's a comment from Sharon Bryan that, that sort of has that same message of that the idea of curating a digital identity is a very important one for both ourselves to consider uh, and for the people we're teaching to. Um, and a, Ruth notes also a digital safety note link that's really helpful. It, look, it's, it's, I think it's just important that if you're having a, a professional account, I, I've always gone by the one, one profile to rule them all, but since the, the, the blurring uh, has happened, I actually think it would have been better to have a separate professional account and just kept you know, my private life and other things off social media. But that's how I feel now. I mean, that's the thing about age and experience. Um, wisdom comes with that. Uh, and, you know, I would have done perhaps done things differently and it's really hard to unwind it. So now I have a private personal Insta account so that I feel safe sharing things to my community who are really supportive around what I share. And, uh, and I, I keep the stuff in the other account that I thought I was safe in um, uh, very, I guess, censored and tame. Although a lot of people would probably think from their standard, it is still very open. So yeah, thank you for that question. Well, Claire's, Claire Thorpe has actually asked one in connection to that, which is what would be the one thing that you would suggest to someone who's just starting to build their professional digital identity? The one thing. Uh, I mean, it's probably the same thing that librarians say all the time. It's, it's all about planning. 
just stop and think about what you want to achieve. So those things on that little infographic around thinking about what your goals are, what, what platforms to use, what voice, what your values are. It's a bit like man, thinking of it as a professional brand. And I, I don't like the professional brand thing because that's it's that thing around getting that balance between authenticity and brand. But you are, you are as Tara said earlier, managing your professional reputation. And for me, I've been very active on social media platforms for a long time, and it's never hindered my work, in fact, or my work opportunities. In fact, it's enhanced it. Uh, and my opportunities, like opportunities to co-author things, opportunities to present at you know, real physical conferences when we still had those things, and uh, all sorts of amazing opportunities because I'm active in social media. Uh, and it is a really good platform if you want to do that kind of networking. And it's kind of safe because you're, you know, behind a screen, behind a keyboard in, in many ways. But, yeah, planning. Take some time and plan. There's, there's no hurry. If you're going to launch a brand um, in the marketplace, you would do the same thing. And essentially what you're doing is constructing a professional identity for your career. That being said, it can evolve and change, and that's a good thing. Just looking through the chat, there is also a comment around professional brand versus authenticity. And whilst it's not a specific question, um, what might be interesting for us to discuss is, is what does that authenticity is there value in that, which I think you've covered in your talk, but how do you harness that in if you are um, starting to build your professional identity as um, a, another person asked earlier? I think when you, um, it, it will evolve over time. I think it's that thing about being true to yourself, uh, which is probably what, what your values are, to get back to what your values are. Uh, you know, Kaufman talks a lot about um, I guess it, the managing impressions can be seen as manipulation if you take it to a certain, and, and branding can as well. So that's why people strive for authenticity in these spaces, uh, particularly if they're um, you know, personal accounts and there's a person behind them. Uh, it, is, it is tricky because you are working on a platform that has its own culture and norms around the way you interact. Our profession has its own norms around the way we interact with one another. So there's lots and lots of things to consider. But for me, it gets back to integrity and values. And that's what I try to practice. Look, I mean, I think because I'm in leadership, I try to talk about uh, failures and taking risks uh, and things that go wrong, because that's the reality of being in leadership. I also talk about, you know, the hard days without details, because that is my reality. And I don't want people to decide they're going to go into leadership and then be shocked by the fact because they think it's all taking selfies and, you know, talking at conferences, because that's not the reality. And I think it, there is definitely a space more in conferences and it's happening more and more to talk about the other side of our profession. That's why I mentioned uh, crit lib because you know, we need to talk about the things that don't work just as much as the things that do work. But I still prefer to be kind of positive and optimistic because that's just the kind of person uh, I am. And uh, you know, to be anything else, I feel a bit disingenuous. Um, Although when it comes to politics, I can criticize loudly, um, just like everyone else. Well, also I'd like to start a long discussion about what does the, um, the social media identity of librarians look like, because I've got a, lots of um, observations of my own. <laughs> librarians and cats, libra there's a whole thing, and I think there's a paper in that, but I'll hand back over to Danielle to uh, wrap us up and to cover any other questions that we may have missed in the chat. Thank you, everyone. All right. 
Uh, I hope you can join me in thanking the presenters today. So the presentations today have been eye-opening, uh, definitely for me. Um, and I thought the parallels of today's presentation is really fascinating. I almost feel like I want to crawl and hide in a hole and not use social media after Terrence, uh, Terra's presentation. However, we have also seen from the other presenters that if used carefully and with awareness of the risks, that we can also use data and data collection to benefit our professional and personal lives. Um, so I'd like to thank Brett Masami and Amanda um, for showing us that data can be used to tell a story, to convey important work and public messages. I'd like to thank Charles um, for showing us that um, collecting data can help with projects that allow us to work collaboratively with students in the wider university community. I'd like to thank uh, Clayton for showing us that we can use um, data visualization efficiently to help us tell that story of data. And I'd like to thank Bruce for giving us some really handy tips on how to um, manage and take ownership of data collection using Python and not to allow the data to control us. A big thank you to uh, Kim for rounding up today's um, theme by reminding us, uh, reminding us that although we have to be mindful and aware of the risks, of social media, that social media, like you said, can also have um, can also be an amazing platform that helps us open up professional opportunities um, and also allow us as library professionals to connect with the wider community in ways that we've lost because of the physical world turning into the digital world. Um, so thank you for basically showing us how we can be dexterous with our professional digital identity. Um, so if you can please fill out that Google poll, that would be uh, great for us and helping us with our next um, event. And to say thank you to all our speakers and facilitators, we have arranged for native trees to be planted on their behalf by a community group through the organization 15 Trees. Um, I also want to finish off by reminding you that our next event um, for the virtual festival, day four, collaboration, communication and participation will be held next week on Thursday, the 11th of February at 12 p.m. Australian Eastern Daylight Savings Time. I hope you can join us on that Thursday. Thank you everyone for attending. I hope you've learned a lot like I have today and that this was very useful for you. Um, if you have any other questions, um, feel free to put it in the chat. We'll see if we've got any time to go through. Otherwise, thank you everyone for attending and have a great day.